we appear to be live on Facebook. Uh, welcome. It's Sunday, April the 19th, 2020. Uh, my name is Alan Clues. This is the online Gurdjieff group, and I'm with Hisham and Brian right now. Um, I should point out or mention that something in me is telling me that I have to change things up a bit. Um, there's a couple of things I want to clean up. I mean, because today's going to be a cleanup program. Next week's going to be a cleanup program. And then I still haven't quite worked out how I want to do it. But I want to change the format slightly. I've been focusing for the last two years a lot on the actual teachings. So what is identification? What is the misuse of sexual energy? Uh, working through a lot of the ideas. I've also been doing and including the inner work and the inner exercises. But I wanna to move to a phase that focuses far more on the inner exercises. I just recently purchased a Kindle uh, edition of Joseph Aziz's book, Gurji, and it's about various inner exercises. Uh, I happen to believe that within the literature, there are far more inner exercises than he outlines in his book, but it's a really good place to start. I don't fully recommend the book. Uh, if you're just really interested in learning the inner exercises, the book is very much an academic text with sometimes 20 to 50 um, footnotes per chapter. Uh, if you really want to go into the academic end of the teachings, it's an interesting book. But if you're interested in the raw uh, uh, inner experiences, the inner work, and as I was talking about with Hisham before we went live on Facebook, uh, inner exercises, you can practice walking down the street, you can practice them when you're talking to people. It's not something that you necessarily do you know, by yourself in your room alone. Uh, it's when you do some inner work like holding on to an awareness of your breath when you speak to people, becoming aware of the relationship between your breath and the words that are flowing out of your mouth can be a profound inner exercise. So I've got a number of people who have asked if they could join the group and I've been holding off because I want to move it much more at this point experientially. I've covered a lot of the teachings. I've really gone in depth to uh, a, a lot of the different aspects of the teachings. But as I've always said, the right inner exercises done for the wrong reasons are better than the wrong inner exercises done for the right reasons. Or the right inner exercises done for the wrong philosophy is better than the wrong inner exercises done for the right philosophy. It's really about the inner work. It's about the way that we can grow and feed and nourish our being. And there are some very interesting inner exercises in the uh, book by uh, Joseph Aziz. And I have to say what I really find interesting is he is giving exercises that he only learned and knew of from George Adi, who was his direct teacher back in the 1980s. So a lot of the information in that book, I have a feeling it's been released for the first time. Uh, he, he goes through a lot of the, the inner exercises contained within the literature. I don't think he breaks them down quite enough as they should be broken down. And some of his breaking them down is perhaps a little too academic. And then I also think he overlooks uh, inner exercises, which are implied in the teachings. And when I say implied, these are found more within the transcripts of the Paris meetings from 1938 to 1945. Uh, and in particular, there's a lot of veiled inner exercises that are in the uh, G.I. Gurdjieff uh, Paris meetings, 1943, that particular book. So my goal is to really focus a bit more on the inner work. 
the teachings, you can read In Search of the Miraculous, you can read Views from the Real World, you can read Fritz Peters, My Journey with the Mystic, C.S. Not, uh, uh, Gurdjie, uh, The Teachings of Gurdjie, A Pupil's Journeys. Those are incredible books. I recommend them if you want to get a handle on the teachings. But it's really the inner work and grappling with ourselves on the inside that's very important. Um, so I'm going to answer two questions that were posed to me online today as best I can. And I want to do a bit of a cleanup in terms of the teachings and everything next week. And then that will bring me to the following week will be the second anniversary or the third anniversary of my doing this, uh, being online. And I want to change it slightly. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to change it. My right now, my thinking is that I want to go and just record myself speaking about the inner exercises, going through, narrating the inner exercises, then putting those up on YouTube, sharing them, and then asking the participants to reflect on their experience that week or those weeks or whatever on the various inner exercises so that we can share our own application of those exercises and use them to grow. There's some fascinating inner exercises that uh, uh, George ID, who along with his wife uh, was a student, a direct student of Mr. Gurdjie. Um, George ID had lung problems and he went into a hospital and they were gonna remove the bad lung and they actually ended up removing the good lung. And he moved to Australia for the better weather. He started a group there. Uh, so he introduced a lot of inner exercises to the members of his group there. And those are the ones that I'm finding fascinating because I've never come across them before. The other ones I've come across, I'm aware of them. I'm aware of where they are in the literature. And I also noticed that he's not covering all of them. Perhaps he's covering the ones that were more formally introduced as a teaching uh, or as an inner exercise and keeping the way away from the ones where it's a bit more implied. So that's the, the direction that I want to go in. I want to then open this up to a few more people and so we can actually talk about the practical application, the inner work, the inner exercises that are connected with this tradition, to put it out there so that people can become aware of these inner exercises and begin to practice them on their own. But before we do an inner exercise, um, Hisham, uh, we've talked for a few minutes before uh, we went live on Facebook. How are things in Morocco, in North Africa? Oh, uh, uh, lately, the state has uh, extended once more for four weeks the, the 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 quarantine so people can go only for uh to uh, outs only for the necessities so uh, uh either to work or to buy uh, to go to the doctor or buy or to the pharmacies or uh, to go to shopping groceries uh, basic groceries uh, also the the, the testing, the testing for the coronavirus, for the COVID-19 is being widespread. Uh, so more people are being tested and more cases are being found out. So, so uh, uh, now uh, we count 2016, about 2016 infected and uh, 5,000 uh, suspected. So, so, uh, so the thing is, uh, is a little bit. Uh, so, and people are are getting have gone have got accustomed, uh, maybe to the to the to the to the actual uh, state. So, uh, they are more aware of the danger of the of this virus, especially in a in a country like Morocco, because the health system is not as as uh, uh, it's not so so developed as in in Europe or in America or Canada, so we might, we have to to be really careful. Uh, uh, our our uh, so I might say that uh, the best uh, the best uh, uh, policy or the best thing to do is to be careful 
uh, about uh, the, the the spreading of the virus not to to contribute to the, to its spreading so that the 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 situation won't get when won't get that the uh, uh, intense for the health system the healthcare system in Morocco. Uh, well, how so, has this affected your inner work? Um, uh, well, uh, I just, uh, as I have already said, uh, my inner work consisted before in 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 uh, uh, in doing it in the outside world. So uh, either in in with friends with, uh, or with uh, in the in the office or when I in in, uh, in meetings. Uh, but now that I have no more these possibilities, I'm trying to do some other things like uh, 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 the, the drawer things and uh, also the, the, the hand in the feet things, which hand sh shall I use, which uh, feet shall I use first in the... Uh, also uh, with the physical exercises I have, uh, uh, I have resumed once more physical, physical exercises at, at home, and when I am doing them, I am trying to to concentrate only on the muscles which needs to be activated during that specific exercise, and to and to relax the others. And uh, so that, um, I, I think that 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 is uh, that was uh, when I succeeded in doing it. Uh, the exercises are always more effective. Uh is there, or, uh, did you find that your um, ability to do inner work is go, has gone up? Mine is. Um, you know, I'm much more present, much more aware. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not having to mm -hmm. think about follow clients and various different things. So my ability to self-remember has mm -hmm. gone up quite considerably mm -hmm. because I'm trying to keep off, you know, away from online. I'm trying to limit certain things that I could easily waste my time doing and focus a bit more on the inner work. It's like I have this oasis, this mm -hmm. respite from the world, from my normal responsibilities, from what I have to normally do. And it allows me to focus more on being present here and now in this moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only say yes. Uh, first, because uh, uh, I also, uh, I, I ca ca categorize myself as being an introvert and uh, and uh, and isolation uh, at a certain period uh, when I have when I have uh, when I have uh, come in contact with this work when I have known of its existence it was uh, uh, in an, an isolated period when, uh, so uh, uh, back in the past uh, I I always had this good experiences when I was, when I isolate myself for a, an extended uh, uh, lapse of time. So for me, it is always easier to work when I am alone, when I am not uh, uh, too much uh, taken and uh, that my, uh, when I am not in, in, the, in, the, in the outside world, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the, a part of the, of the of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of the most of the exercises that I have been doing these last three years is to be able to to uh, to to be to function in the outside world because that, that was all always a problem for me uh, being anxious being uh, introverted so it was a huge uh, source of inner exercises that have uh, helped me. To uh, to go uh, further in the work, uh, but I prefer, but I I always feel so now I can say that I can function pretty easily in the outside world, but I always uh, uh, feel better and best when I am isolated in situations like this. Okay, uh, Brian, how are things down in Phoenix? Uh, pretty good. The governor just announced uh, last week that they'll be lifting a lot of the uh, restrictions off businesses um, at the end of the month. So um, that was good to hear. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that, bring things uh, back to a little bit more of a normalcy. Um, but I also agree with um, both of you that you know, during the quarantine time, um, the ability to do the inner work has definitely increased. And 
mainly just taking that extra time in the mornings. Um, you know, even though I would designate time, um, normally, uh, I still think I rushed it, you know, cause I did have a lot of other things to do. So I wasn't as calm as I should have been when I started the inner exercise or I didn't let the, um, uh, as the recording would say, let the emanation settle the way they should mm -hmm. um, because I'd be kind of rushing off like, okay, like, inner I think you froze in there. Um, I understand that one very well. I'm done. Now I'm going to get into the world. I'm going to get into life. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you've, uh, your face is frozen and your voice has disappeared for a while. So um, let me just share the screen. Uh, the recognition that this is not something we just do for ourselves. I do this work for myself. But doing this work, I also do this work for mankind, for humanity. And I also do this work for the earth herself. I have a physical body composed of the elements of the earth. It comes from the earth, it returns to the earth. So whenever I do inner work, it affects my physical body, especially if there's an awareness of my physical body. My essence, my inner nature. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that it's human essence. I can't be identified with it. I shouldn't be identified with my essence. So whenever I do inner work, it will also affect my essence and through my essence, humanity. So this is something that we do not do for ourselves. There's an element of it that comes back to ourselves, but we do it for the world and for humanity. Um, this come, the next one, this comes from Roger Lipsy's book, Gurdjieff Reconsidered. Uh, it's an English translation of a conversation that Mr. Gurdjieff had with one of his French pupils during the Second World War. And Mr. Gurdjieff told his French pupil to say this. And I love this. I think it's, it's wonderful because it shows as well that we are not just doing this for ourselves for what we can achieve. I wish to be. I can be. I have the ability to be. Or I have the right to be. I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. So I would like you to all just become aware of your body. This is one of the things that is repeated throughout the book by Joseph Aziz about Gurdjieff exercises is that it all it actually all begins with relaxation. It begins with the ability to relax the body. And this is an absolute fundamental prerequisite. And then it begins with the ability to sense the body. Um, I don't have the direct references in front of me right now. Um, apparently, there were many different phrases that Mr. Gurdjieff used that reflected this same truth. Um, the one that I fixated on was the one that was found in uh, meetings with remarkable men, where he talked about the development of the sensation of myself. And this, the way I describe it, is the awareness of our body as one organic whole. So it's the awareness of the organic self. So let's just begin and try to become aware of the effect of gravity on our body. Notice gravity, notice how our body is being 
pull down. Notice where your sitting bones meet with the chair beneath you, where your thighs perhaps meet with the chair, perhaps where your feet connect with the ground. Become aware of the sensation of gravity. And this, the sensation of gravity and balance and the things I'm going to go through, they come from a website called endlesssearch.co.uk that was put together by a student of Paul Beidler, who was a student of Mr. Gurdji. And we've got special receptors in our brains that can detect and become aware of the effect of gravity on our body. Then we've also got certain detectors that can help us to become aware of balance. And this is more located within our inner ear. The sense of balance is connected to the inner ear. But become aware of how your head is balanced on your neck, which is balanced on your shoulder, your collarbone, your shoulder blades, your rib cage, your breastbone, your spine, and how your torso is balanced on your pelvis, on your sitting bone. Become aware of that internal perception of balance. And then we also have special nerve nodes within our brain that are devoted to the perception of atmospheric pressure. If, like me, you live in a place that doesn't have a lot of mountains and going up and down and high peaks and whatever. It's sort of filters and slips into the background. But, you know, if you live in an area with mountains and you go up and down, uh, the awareness of atmospheric pressure becomes more noticeable. If you've been in a swimming pool, you can feel the atmospheric pressure, or not really the atmospheric pressure, but the water pressure around your body. Right now, wherever you are, there is a similar atmospheric pressure. There's the pressure of the air around you. And this pressure actually gets a little denser uh, when the barometric pressure lowers, when rain comes in. And as the rain goes away and the skies clear up, it gets a little bit less. Try to become aware of the air pressing against your body. And then try to become aware of the external temperature in the room around you. Try to notice, detect, become aware in whatever way you can, the temperature of the air in the room. And then move inwards. Try to become aware of your own internal temperature. As little children, at least I did with my children, my mother did with me. Whenever she thought I had a fever or whenever I thought my children had a fever, I would take my wrist and put it against the forehead. So within me, I'm far more aware of my body's own internal temperature in my forehead just because I'm habituated to that. It's something that I've become aware of over the years, but I can also become aware of the temperature in my hands. I can actually be, be aware right now, you can't see it. One of the beautiful things about doing this is I'm actually in track pants and I have bare feet and I can feel how my feet are cold. And they're much colder than the temperature of my forehead. So perhaps you can notice uh, differential um, some people, they get cold hands, cold feet. Perhaps you can notice how warm your hands are or how cold they are. And then let's move inwards. Try to become aware of the inside of your mouth. Try to become aware of the roof of your mouth. Try to become aware of your teeth, your teeth planted in both the upper and lower uh, bones. Try to become aware of your tongue. Your tongue is an incredible muscle. For me right now, I'm aware of the movement of my tongue. And through the movement of our tongue, we make sounds. 
If I move the tongue to the very back of my mouth, that's where I make oo, oo. If I move it to the front, e, e, oo, e, oo, e. If I move it down in the back, o, o, o. If I move it down in the front, e, a, e, a, e, a. These are all done through the movement of the tongue. The tongue is a very interesting place to study the moving center. When we talk, to be aware of the movement of our tongue. So just become aware of the presence of your tongue in your mouth. And then become aware of your upper teeth, how they're connected to the upper facial bone. And then aware of your lower teeth, how they're connected to the jawbone. Perhaps even becoming aware of your jawbone, maybe even aware of the fleshy part immediately underneath your tongue, below your mouth. And then let's move backwards to the back of the mouth. As you breathe in with your mouth shut, notice how you can sense the air flowing in the back of your mouth. And then let's move to the nostrils. Become aware of the sensation of air flowing in and out your nostrils. In the Buddha's great discourse on mindfulness, this is the first thing he tells his students to be aware of, to be aware of the tip of your nose and the air passing in and out. And then become aware of the air flowing in and out your nose or your nose, your nostrils. Your nostrils go up about this far. And then behind the nostrils, sort of above the eyes, behind the cheekbones in there are the nasal passages. So become aware of the air entering in through the tip of your nose. Become aware of it going through your nose. Become aware of it going through your nasal passages, both in and out. And then from your nasal passages, it goes to the back of your throat. So become aware of all of this as you breathe in. And then as you breathe out. And then become aware of the air as it flows past your throat, down into your throat. And then it moves down into the windpipes and down into the lungs. Become aware of your lungs inflating and deflating the movement of your lungs. And then return to your mouth. Return your awareness to the inside of your mouth. Return your awareness to the back of your mouth. And then let's move down your throat. But rather than going to your windpipes, moving down into your esophagus down into your stomach, down into your duodenum. We actually have brain cells that come from the vagus nerve, which is called the wandering nerve that wanders all down and it sends out ganglion and ganglion are brain cells. And the brain cells of the vagus nerve are in our stomach, they're in our duodenum and they go right to the very top of our large intestine. Try to become aware of the movement, the flow of your intestines. It moves down your stomach and then on the right side, it comes back up. Where it starts to come back up, that's where the appendix are. Then it comes back up and then it begins to form the transverse colon. And we can also connect with it as it turns into our colon, our rectum. There was a point in our distant past, way in the past, where our ancestors were mere, mere feeding tubes from the mouth, throat, down through the digestive process to the rectum. So part was the first part was involved in the digestion of food, and the second part was involved with the elimination of the waste products. So just try to become aware of that inner aspect of you. Within the octave of food, the food we eat 
mixes with the saliva and with the energy of our teeth. This is the note of Do 768. Then the next transformational station, so to speak, is our stomach. And then the next one is our duodenum. And then air comes into the process and allows the formation of blood in the liver. And it moves in a different way. But below the duodenum is more of the vegetative self. This is where we still have that connection with plants, where that plant self is still within us, the lower parts of our digestive process. So try to become aware from your mouth, your throat, your esophagus, your stomach, your duodenum, down into your large and small intestines, up the transverse colon, down the colon to your rectum. Try to become aware of that dimension of yourself, that inner dimension. And then let's just try then to take a general snapshot, take a, a general picture to become aware generally, not specifically of any particular place, but to generally become aware of the inside of our body. We have internal sensations and we have external sensations. Try to become aware of internal sensations. Just a general awareness. And then let's become a little more specific. Try to become aware of the movement of the various muscles involved in breathing. Try to become aware of the movement of your diaphragm. It's a parachute shaped muscle that as it expands down the diaphragmic cavity, it pulls the lungs open like bellows and as it contracts back up, it pushes the lungs closed and pushes the air out. Acts like bellows. We don't use the muscles in our lungs to breathe. It's the bellow, like pulling the air in and pushing the air out that is done by our diaphragm that's really responsible for our breathing. Become aware of the various abdominal muscles also involved in breathing. Become aware of the intercostal muscles between your ribs that are also involved in breathing. Your diaphragm is actually connected through nerves to these abdominal muscles and these intercostal muscles between our ribs. So the diaphragm actually sends signals to them to expand and contract. The, the order, the signals, the command comes from the diaphragm to those muscles. So become aware of the interconnected nature between your diaphragm, the various muscles involved in breathing in your abdomen, and the muscles involved in breathing between your ribs. Become aware of the expansion and contraction of these muscles. And then try to still your thoughts. Try to still your body. Try to calm your breathing. And do your best. For some people, this is much easier, particularly if you've worked on it. Try to become aware of your heart. Try to become aware of your heart beating. Try to become aware of your pulse. We're actually more able to be aware of our pulse in our extremities, in our hands. Try to become aware of your heart beating and the relationship, awareness of the pulse of blood flowing through your body. Try to become aware of your body on the inside. And then focus on the external sensation. Focus on the sensory nerve nodes that you have in your skin. We actually have 
I believe it's close to twice the sensory nerve nodes in our hands than we do in our very lower back. We have more sensory nerve nodes in our hands and then in our feet than we do anywhere else in the body. If you've ever seen some of those brain maps, you will realize just what a disproportionate part of the brain is taken up by our hand. And then because our feet have a similitude with our hands, they come next. So become aware of your hands, of your feet. Notice how you can perceive, how you can become aware, how you can sense your hands and feet better than you can your lower back. That there is more information that your brain receives from the nerves in your hands than your lower back. And then try to become aware of the sensation of clothing on your body. Try to become aware of the weave of the cloth of perhaps the pants you are wearing or perhaps shorts or if you're wearing a dress. Try to become aware of the weave of that cloth as it touches your body. If you're wearing a different shirt, then say your pants, you know, if you're in a single dress, you won't be able to notice it. But try to notice how you can actually become aware of the difference in the weave and the texture from your pants as opposed to your shirt. That your skin and the sensory nerve nodes in your skin are able to pay attention to this difference. And then become aware of the air as it touches your face, as it touches your skin, the skin of your hands. If you're in shorts or a shirt, perhaps the skin of your legs, or if you're not wearing shoes, the skin of your feet. Try to become aware of your skin and the different sensory impressions that are received by your skin. And then let's try to pull this all together and finish with Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. As a vessel fills with warm golden honey, allow your body to slowly fill with sensation. At first, just try your best to only sense the bottom of your feet. Focus all of your attention on the bottom of your feet, on your soles, your instep, the bottom of your heels, the balls of your feet, the balls of your toes. And then slowly fill with sensation up through to the top of your feet. Become aware not only of the bottom of your feet, but the bones in your feet, the bones in your toes, your toenails, the muscles in your feet. And then move up to the awareness, bring it up to your ankle. Aware of yourself from the bottom of your feet up to your ankles. Become aware of your ankle bones. And let's move this awareness slowly up the body. So up through the lower part of the lower legs, up through the middle part to the upper part of the lower legs, up to your knees, up to the lower part of your upper legs, the middle part of your upper legs, up to your hips. Become aware of your hips, your pelvis, your buttocks, buttocks, and your hand. And slowly allow this awareness from the bottom of your feet to move up through your hands, your hips, into your lower torso, so your lower abdomen, lower back, up through to your midriff, middle back, elbows, up through to your chest, your upper arms, your upper back, shoulder blades, to your shoulder and allow this awareness from the bottom of your feet all the way up to your shoulders to continue up through the lower part of your neck, the middle part, the upper part of your neck, and then allow it to begin to flow up through your head 
to the very top of your head, developing the sensation of self. Try to become aware of your body as one organic whole. Try to maintain this awareness of your physical body, to sense your physical body at once, and to recognize that this ability to sense your physical body as one organic whole is an absolute prerequisite for all further inner work. Without being able to master this awareness, a lot of the other inner exercises will be meaningless. If you do them without being able to do this, it will be to use one of Mr. Gurdjieff's wonderful phrases, like pouring from the empty to the void. So become aware of your physical body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, from front to back, side to side. Become aware both of the internal and the external sensation. Become aware of both the internal and the external sensations, the sense of clothing, the sense of air that touches your face. Become aware of your embodiment, your physical self. And then allow your attention to rest. And finishing with the collected state exercise. As the earth has an atmosphere, so too do we have an atmosphere. Our atmosphere can extend in all sorts of dis different directions. It can dissipate. It can be pulled in the direction of our interests, where we're focusing on. Collect it. Draw it towards yourself. Pull it back to yourself, perhaps a meter, meter and a half. Become aware of the boundary of your atmosphere. Keep it tranquil. Keep it still. Keep it calm. And in a moment, I'm gonna count from one to three. And when I get to three, breathe your atmosphere in. And then as you breathe out, imagine that something remains. Imagine that emanations that were within your atmosphere that were created through this inner work begin to settle within you. One, two, three. And as you breathe out again, imagine something remains. And then silently repeat after me. May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just slowly come back into this moment. And try to hold on to this awareness of your body, not just for the duration of this meeting, but for the duration of this day, of this week, of this month. When you're sitting, become aware of your body sitting. When you stand up, become aware of your body standing up. If you have to go outside, go to a shop, take a dog for a walk, become aware of your body walking. Try to bring your awareness back to your physical presence. Bring your awareness back to your body as often as you can throughout the day. Now, I posted a question um, about a week or so ago online. Um, I got too many responses. It took up a lot of my time, so I've hidden it from my timeline. But there were two questions that I didn't answer because I thought it would be great questions to answer now. And I'm going to just uh, um, share my screen. Um, so Andrew G asked, how do I know when I'm awake or just dreaming I am awake? And Luce C asked, can you describe levels of being? Now, to me, these are linked. Uh, people talk about being awake. People speak, oh yeah, I'm awake or I'm asleep. But these are nominalizations in a sense. Uh, awake, how can I tell if I am awake? 
awake in the context of that sentence is a noun, but it's really a nominalization. It comes from a verb. It comes from the verb to awaken. When we say awake, we strip the initial verb of a lot of its meaning. To awaken has a much more specific context and much more specific understanding and meaning than to be awake. And so there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of misunderstanding. What does it mean to be awake? In one sense of the word, only God is fully conscious. Only God is fully awake. And here we have to understand levels of being to really understand what it means by being awake. And so we have to define this word very carefully. And I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, so the diagram of all living things, I've got on the left, the diagram as it was given to uh, P.D. Uspensky by Mr. Gurdjieff. Um, probably closer to 1917 in St. Petersburg in Russia. And then on the right, particularly with the words in red, I've added my own um, understanding of this, contextualizing it, making it more meaningful. But if we focus on the numbers, let me just uh, come in with um, So, absolute, one, eternal, unchanging, three, archangel, six, 12, angel, 24, man, 48 vertebrates, 96 invertebrates, all the way down to metal. Let me just pull it back out again. So, to understand what it means to be awake, we have to contextualize it. These numbers all re represent different hydrogen. So hydrogen one is the molecule of God. Hydrogen three is the molecule. If you see on the right, I have the term holy reconciled. Hydrogen six on the right, the term holy denying. I consider these three to be the Godhead the realm of the holy forces. Then we come down, and if you look on the right, let's see if I can, uh, I'm not sure where my controls are. They should be somewhere here. Ah, there they are. Um, so the realm of the awake man. When we speak of awakening, when I speak of awakening, I'm speaking of hydrogen 12. Truly awake, truly conscious, fully aware is hydrogen one. That's the realm of God. But as a human being, when we talk about the awakened state, I'm talking about hydrogen 12. Um, let me just stop this. Um, within this diagram, this is the food diagram. It's my re-representation of the food diagram as found in chapter nine of In Search of the Miraculous. We can also, um, and again, I don't know, oh, whoops. Why my controls keep on disappearing? Oh, there they are. Um, so we can again, see the awakened state, the realm of 12. So on one level, it's the realm of angels. So over here, the angelic realm. Here, it's also the realm of the awakened man. And here, it's also the solar realm. So awakened, we can say that the sun is an awakened being. 
It's on the level of what I define as being awake. It's not the highest awakened state. Um, let me just get rid of these. Stop this. Um, go back to this. It's not the absolute. It's not the eternal unchanging. It's not the archangels. Not the holy affirming. Not the holy reconciling. Not the holy denying. It is actually the fourth level down. Now, levels of being. Levels of being are all related to the level of energy that is transformed at that particular point. So, Mr. Gurdjieff gave us a definition. He said that each level down is half as dense, half as vibrant, twice as stupid, and half as aware as the level above. And we can substitute awake for the word aware. So we can talk about the fact that if we look at the diagram and look at metals, that metals are awake. They have a certain level of conscious awareness. It's a real low, dense level of conscious awareness, but they are not pure, inanimate objects. There's some kind of vitality some kind of an awareness within them. Within Hinduism, they talk about consciousness going into a swoon and getting lost in matter and then having to evolve back out. So we can say that the minerals are twice as awake, twice as aware, twice as vibrant, twice as intelligent, twice as conscious as the metals. The plants being twice as vibrant, twice as awake, twice as aware as the metal, are actually four times more awake and aware than the minerals. So understanding these levels, understanding what these numbers mean. And so when I talk about the awakened state, I'm actually talking about hydrogen 12, which is the fourth level down. To be truly awake, only God, only the absolute, only the divine can be truly awake. But when we talk about awakened man, we're actually speaking of something very high compared to non-awakened man. And here, if we focus on, let me see if I can get these controls back again. I don't know, ah, there they are. I don't know how they disappear and how I get them back. I just have to move my cursor. Um, so these levels are the three levels of man. These levels are the three levels of man. We can be centered in hydrogen 48, we can be centered in hydrogen 24, and we can be centered in hydrogen 12. What this shows us is that it's not that we are in the state of waking sleep, that we are slumbering man, and we go from slumbering man to being an awakened man. There's an intermediary stage in between. So we go from the state of waking sleep to being half asleep, half awake, to being awake. Now also understand that this is not like an electron and the orbits of an electron. So you're either in this orbit or you're in that orbit, that there is a continuum that each one of these levels, perhaps we could divide it into an octave. So we could say that in the realm of vertebrates and slumbering man, you know, there are creatures that exist at the note do, 
you know, perhaps, and for the vertebrates, you know, it could be a guppy. You know, the, the, the simplest creature to have a spinal column and central nervous system. And then we can speak perhaps of reptiles, perhaps of mammals, and then humans at the top. So these are not discrete categories. You're not in this category, and then you flip up to the next one. There are levels within these categories. Uh, let me just get rid of those. So, for instance, the intermediary state between waking sleep and being awake, we can actually get a bit of an experience of this. Just become aware of your hands. Focus only on your hands. And as you do so, it's a very low level of the state closer to the note, the low dough of the state. Now, we have a head brain. We have a body brain. We have a feeling brain. This intermediary state is actually the mindful state. Whenever we bring mindful awareness, we are entering into this immediate mediary state between waking sleep and being awake. Uh, so to be aware of my body, to sense my body as one organic whole, to become and develop the sensation of self is not a phenomenon of being awake. It's a phenomenon, it's a dimension of being in that intermediary state. Every act of mindful awareness involves the transformation of hydrogen 12. There's a specific form of hydrogen 12 that gets transformed with my head brain. We can actually represent it. We can name this molecule, this hydrogen that's produced when I become aware of what I can see or aware of what I can hear or aware of what I can smell or aware of what I can taste. There's a different molecule, a different form of hydrogen 24 that is transformed when I become aware of anything to do with my physical body, whether or not it is just merely becoming aware of my thumb or becoming aware of my whole body. So this is a process that we can build up. And going to my other diagram, um, we can look at these specific molecules. So the molecule involved in the head brain mindful awareness is ray 24. So become aware of the screen that you're looking at. Become aware of the edges of the screen. Become aware of what's behind the screen, what's beside the screen. In order to become mindful of this awareness, this visual awareness, you are transforming ray 24. This is a ray 24 on the octave of impressions uh, product, this mindful awareness of what you see. Same with what you hear, what you smell, and what you taste. The sensation of your body, this awareness of your physical body is law 24. So, the inner exercise we did earlier to become aware of your physical self, to become aware of your hands, your feet, your body. This requires, this is the byproduct of hydrogen 24. You are aware of your hands. As you are aware of your hands, you are transforming hydrogen 24. It's essential to this awareness of your hands. Now, as I mentioned, we have a head brain, a body brain, and a feeling brain. To become mindful of what you're feeling involves the transformation of thought 24 of the octave of food. 
So if you can take a moment and smile, if you can take a moment and try to bring an awareness of an emotional state into your body, in other words, become mindful of your emotional state, this awareness of your feeling, this awareness of your emotion is a product of Ba 24 of the octave of emotion. So this mindful awareness, this sensation of my body, this awareness of what I can see, hear, smell, taste, this awareness of my feelings, these are not the awakened state. They are that intermediary state between sleep and awake. And as I said, you know, there within each one of these states, there's a continuum. It's probably do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do, moving from the lowest to the highest. We can talk about the highest level of this intermediary state is the simultaneous mindful awareness of all three brains. This is advanced self-remembering. So if in this moment you can be mindful of what you see, hear, smell and taste, and hold on to this mindful awareness of what you see, hear, smell and taste, and then become mindful, aware of your body at the same time. We're moving up to intermediate mindful awareness. We're moving higher, but we're not at the highest level of this intermediate state. But try to do this. Notice what you can see. Notice colors, shapes. Notice objects nearby, far away, form. Notice the difference between colors. Notice hues. Then become aware of what you can hear while holding on to what you can see. Become aware of my voice. Become aware of sounds in your room, perhaps computer sounds. And holding on to what you can see and hear, become aware of what you can smell. Perhaps your own body odor, perhaps the odor, the scent in the room around you. And then while holding on to these three, become aware of the taste in your mouth. This is a pretty advanced, for a lot of people, mindfulness exercise. To become aware of these four dimensions, these four perceptual dimensions, looking, listening, smelling, and tasting at once. Try to hold on to them and then add the awareness of your physical body, aware of what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can taste, while sensing your body as one organic whole. And we're moving up through this intermediary level. Add to that the awareness of your emotion. And you're becoming mindful with all three brains. And we're moving right up to the top of this intermediate level, almost to the level of the awakened state. So try to do this. Try to become aware of what you can see, hear, smell, taste, while sensing your body, while becoming aware of what you are feeling. Perhaps smile, perhaps bring a certain joy or delight to your eyes, to the muscles in your face. Try to perceive perhaps this joy as you smile in your heart, while also being aware of what you see, hear, smell, taste, and the sensation of your body. At this point, you are then transforming Law 24 of the octave of food, the sensation of your body, Fa 24, of the octave of air through the mindful awareness of your emotions and ray 24 of the octave of impressions through the mindful awareness of what you can see, hear, smell, and taste. And recognize that this is just the intermediary state. The state below, so 12 of the octave of food. This is the non-awareness of our body. 
I want you to really, really, really focus on your hands. Become as mindful of your hands as you can to bring your whole awareness to your hands, to sense the bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, the fingers, to sense your hands as completely as possible. And in this moment, your hands were transforming. La 24 of the octave of food and your knees were transforming soul 48. You weren't aware of your knees. You were so focusing on your hands. You weren't aware of your knees. Now that I brought your knees into the picture, your knees have stepped up. It's that non-awareness of our physical body. You go camping and you're a normal person. And you're in the thoughts and words of your picture and your head brain and you're this and that. And then later that night as you're sitting around the campfire, you notice that your arm is scratched and you have no awareness of when or how you scratched your arm. It's because your arm and your body at that moment were in that state of waking sleep. They were transforming hydrogen 48. It's like a non-awareness. It's like blankly staring out a window and thinking about what Mary said to Sue last night and how that was outrageous. You're not aware of the information your eyes are receiving. Your eyes are still feeding. They're still getting energy from the outside world, but you are not mindful of it. You are not aware of it. You are in that state of sleep that state of slumbering sleep, that state of what I like to call as waking sleep, where you're awake, but you're asleep. So we can begin to compare our mindful perception to our sleeping perception. Become aware of the air flowing in from your nose to your lungs and back out again, and then compare this to the non-awareness of the bottom of your feet. Now that you're aware of the bottom of your feet, you're transforming a higher level of energy. And understand that these levels of being, these states are all dependent on the energy that we transform. So the waking state is something different. The waking state requires the transformation of hydrogen 12. It is a different kind of an awareness than the mindful state or the state of waking sleep. But before I go into that, I want to uh, come back to here. Um, this came from a different book. Um, I'm not fully in agreement with it, but it's a good place to start. This is Joseph Aziz. Um, it's the book that he wrote, uh, George I.D., a Gurdjieff pupil in Australia. And Joseph Aziz said, Addy told us that, and I put the words waking sleep, because there's a difference between the sleep we have in our bed and the state of sleep we're in uh, and humanity's in. Addy told us that waking sleep had seven features identification, considering, negative emotion, unnecessary talking, lying, formatory thinking, daydreaming, and imagination. These last two being two aspects of one feature, daydreaming and imagination. And here, as I said, I have some problems with this. Because there's a difference between internal considering and external considering. He just lists considering here. And not only is there a difference between internal considering and external considering, considering, internal considering is a subset of identification. So Identification, you could take out considering because considering is a dimension. It's an aspect of identification. 
So Addy told them that these are the seven features of sleep. When you're in a state of identification, that means when you're, when you're so lost in something, you are not present. You are not aware of yourself. You're in a state of identification. The antidote to the state of identification is the sensation of self. If whatever you're doing, this awareness of yourself is part of your observation, part of your thoughts, part of your reading, whatever you're doing, you will not be in that state of identification. State identification is where we've completely lost ourselves. And then when we get to the considering, there are two different forms of considering. Internal considering, oh, poor me, how could they have said that to me? Why is it raining on me? It's very much the taste of the ego, but external considering is actually an act of mindful awareness. It requires the transformation of hydrogen 24. It requires us to step up into that intermediate state. External considering is where we become mindful of the person that we're talking to. We're mindful of their expression. We're mindful of their body. We're mindful of what they're doing. We are considering them. We are focusing our awareness here and now in this moment onto the information, whether it's auditory or visual or even smell olfactory um, that we're receiving from them. And we are adjusting our own communication and our own way of being to be more receptive to them. So not only does it involve us being mindful of what they're doing, it also involves us being mindful of our reactions. So if we're sitting like this with our arms crossed and just bleh, that's more of a state of internal considering. But if we can do this and we're doing it consciously, we're playing a role and we're aware of the effect it has on them, that's the transformation of hydrogen 24. That's the lifting of ourselves up into the state of personal consciousness. Now, this is what Adi taught his group in Australia. I like the list that Mr. Gurdjieff uh, presented Uspensky in chapter nine of In Search of the Miraculous. I've talked about this before. So these words come from Mr. Gurdjieff. They're quoted by P.D. Uspensky. It's found in chapter nine. And this is how the human machine leaks energy. These are the ways we do not conserve our energy and the mindful awareness and the awakened state are both energetic states and they require certain energies. And if we engage in this list of activities, we generally fritter and waste our energies. Mr. Gurdjieff, you know, had a metaphor of you know, the carriage, the horse, the driver, or, or the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the person in the cabin and the driver. And he said that, you know, things can go wrong. You know, perhaps the axles aren't greased properly or connections are frayed or uh, whatever. And it's the human machine. Our human machine is broken. We do not understand how it's supposed to work efficiently and these are the ways the human machine is broken these are the ways we leak and waste the energy that we should be conserving to become more mindful to lift our awareness up so these are also aspects of sleep unnecessary and unpleasant emotions the expectation of pleasant things possible and impossible. Bad moods, unnecessary haste, nervousness, worry, irritability, imagination, daydreaming, wrong work of centers, unnecessary tension in the muscles, Actually, let me just go back. Imagination and daydreaming. 
in the earlier quote from Adi, he used these two words and then he said that they're both the same. I disagree. I think imagination is more of a waste of the head brain energy. And it's more of a head brain phenomenon. And daydreaming is more of a healing brain, waste of energy. So when we talk about the wrong work of centers, daydreaming is an example of the emotional center hijacking the intellectual center for wrong work. Whereas imagination is more, it's a bit different. Imagination is at this level, and there is a higher level of imagination, a higher form of imagination. At this level, it's really more the wrong work of the intellectual center of the words and pictures that flow around in our mind. Um, so I also list like daydreaming as the wrong work. It's the emotional center stealing energy from the intellectual center. So these, these, these categories blur. Um, the unnecessary tension of muscles. Hisham mentioned earlier, he's starting to do work on his body, awareness of his body. He's doing exercises and he's only trying to use those muscles involved in the exercise. Relaxing the rest of the body. Perpetual chatter. Some people need to talk. My mother had to talk. She talked to strangers. If there was no one around, she would talk to the cat. If the cat was in a different room, she would talk to her plants. She was engaged in perpetual chatter, leaking her energy that way. Interest continually taken in things happening around us or to other people and having, in fact, no interest whatsoever. This could be the definition of People magazine or Entertainment Tonight or those gossip magazines. Constant waste of the force of attention. This is, all of this is the waste of the force of attention. So we cannot bring ourselves to be mindful. Restlessness, the constantly moving flow of thoughts in our mind, formatory thinking, the continual change of mood, feelings, and emotions. So these Going right back up to the top to what Adi, Adi said, oops. Identification, considering negative emotion, unnecessary talking, lying, formatory thinking, daydreaming and imagination, as well as this list are actually dimensions. They're aspects of sleep. But here it gets a little more complex. Um, I know from personal experience that I can be in a state of internal considering. Why did they say that to me? Da, 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 and be mindful of myself in this state. I know I can experience a negative emotion and be mindful of that negative emotion. I've talked on many occasions um, that there is a difference between mechanical depression, that's depression at the level of hydrogen 48, and mindful depression, that's depression at the level of hydrogen 24. Mindful depression is far worse than mechanical depression. When we exist in a state of mechanical depression, we're not aware of it. We're not, we don't notice it, but it upsets everyone in our life. How can you be so negative? How can you say those things? And we're all me negative. But we can be mindful of our depression and it makes it worse. So these are not absolute discrete categories. I can be mindful of myself daydreaming. Usually if I allow myself to daydream, I get completely lost in it. I can be mindful of imagination. I can be mindful that I'm talking too much and that my mouth is moving a little bit too much and that I'm talking too quickly and that the words are flowing too much and too quickly out of my mouth. 
So, you know, these are not absolute categories, that there are levels and there are levels and there are levels. So to explain this requires a lot of nuance. It requires a lot of understanding. And so people who throw around the word sleep and awake and all of these without defining it properly, without contextualizing it, without understanding the relationships of the different levels and energies and whatever, we are just speaking gibberish. I can talk to you about being awake and you may think you understand me, but you have a completely different conception of being awake. When someone asks this question, when the person asks this question uh, on my wall, on the post I had, someone said, well, just become aware perhaps of your body or something like that. And I said, no, no, that's not the awakened state. That's not being awake. That's half awake. I didn't explain it like I'm explaining here. For them, just to become aware of the body was a phenomenon of awakening, to become aware of your breath was a dimension of awakening. So when I talk about awakening and they would talk about awakening, we could think we're talking about the same things and we would be talking about two entirely different things. They were actually really talking about the realm of mindful awareness rather than the realm of the awakened state, which then um, brings me to this. I'm not sure if I'll have enough time, but this is the one thing we don't really want to talk about too much. Um, here, C12, SO12, and ME12. These are the molecules of the awakened state. There have been various words that Mr. Gurdjieff has used that we can apply. I like to apply the word being to C12, to that particular awareness generated by the transformation of C12, being. It's a deeper, higher, more refined physical awareness than just the sensation of self. It's at a different level. It's something qualitatively different. Oops, I think I'm getting some kind of sound coming from there. Um, so 12, a word that Mr. Gurdjieff has used is conscience. The awareness of feeling everything at once. So 12 is also the higher emotional center. There's a deep intelligence to this awareness. Most people may experience flashes, moments, brief seconds here and there of the state throughout their life as they do with being, with that higher perception of the physical self, of that physical dimension. Um, J.G. Bennett said that at the level of 48, we talk about brains. At the level of 24, and these are the terms Mr. Gurdjieff uses in Beelzebub of Tales to his grandson. At the level of 24, we talk about centers. But whenever Mr. Gurdjieff refers to a spiritualized part of a whole, there's a unity to the experience at the awakened state. So in the mindful state, we can become aware of our body. But at the level of the awakened state, when we become aware of our body, there's a triunal aspect. There is also a head brain aspect and a body brain aspect, but brains are at the level of 48. Uh, centers at 24 and spiritualized hearts at 12. So when we speak of the awakened state, it's like becoming a solar being. It's like lifting up the center of gravity of our psychic state up 
to the level of the sun. When we talk about that intermediary state between waking and sleep, we can also say it's equivalent to the planetary realm. The earth state, the state of sleep, is the earth. Now, me 12, this is a higher awareness of the world around us. This is where inanimate objects seem to possess a life force. This is where things become more magical. You see more magical things. I have a friend who has been experimenting with psilocybin, with magic mushrooms, taking small doses, a gram, gram and a half, and then going outside into nature. And he keeps a journal. And the perceptions that he is describing when he is on this particular entheogen, I said to him, what you're experiencing is me 12. If you've ever done an entheogen, if you've ever done anything like psilocybin or ayahuasca or whatever, you will have an understanding of what me 12 is. How everything seems so much more alive, so much richer, so much more vibrant, and not just visually, but auditorily, in terms of our smell, in terms of the taste in our mouth. This one, the awareness of me 12, is the one that we can hack into through the use of entheogens, through the use of psychedelics. However, you can also derail on the use of psychedelics. So it should really be done in a proper context. This friend of mine is in his late 60s. He's been on the mystical path ever since he was in his early 20s. He's done a lot of inner work on himself. Um, he's got the presence of mind to use it responsibly. Um, otherwise, it can do all sorts of things if you're not properly prepared. So for most people, my advice is to keep away from them. But most people, particularly in North America, have tried LSD. They've tried other things. LSD is head brain. It's not body brain. It's not feeling brain. But it wakes you up to me well. That perceptual awareness you have, there's a luminosity, there's a glow um, of what is happening. So the awakened state is this triunal state um, of head brain, body brain, feeling brain, all transforming three parts of a whole, this higher energy. Everything seems more vibrant, more alive. I mean, when you think of every level below being twice as dense, twice as stupid, every level above being twice as intelligent, twice as aware, twice as vibrant. You become twice as aware. Your perceptions are twice as vibrant. Your perceptions are twice as intelligent as they are for the level below. So when someone says, you know, what's the difference between waking and sleep? It's not something that can be answered in a pithy sentence or even a paragraph or even 10 paragraphs. According to these teachings, it's a very complex phenomenon. Our goal is the awakened state. We have to move through the mindful state to the awakened state. We have to figure out how we're leaking energy at the level below the mindful state, how we're wasting that energy through negative emotions identification those lists of characteristics and begin to plug those leaks. And when we plug those leaks, they will only allow us to step up to the next level, that intermediate state. And then through specific inner exercises, through inner work, through a lot of other stuff, and through this process of building ourself, growing ourself at the mindful level, growing our Kesjian body, we then create a base for the movement up into the awakened state. So this is, you know, a very complex phenomenon, a very complex topic. And this is the goal. Our goal is to become awakened beings. 
Our goal is to step up and transform hydrogen 12. Hydrogen 12 is twice as refined, twice as intelligent, twice as vibrant as hydrogen 24. So just again, become aware of your hands, become aware of your body. Just sense your body. This is hydrogen 24. The awakened state is a physical awareness that's even higher than that. The same with con or mindfully looking, listening, smelling. It's a much higher, more vibrant, more intelligent, more living, more alive, more dynamic perception. And then sleep, even in the state of waking sleep, we're far more awake than an invertebrate, something that doesn't have a spinal column or a plant or a mineral or a metal. So we can also talk about waking as one of these relative terms that we need to understand. At any rate, uh, a lot to think about, um, a lot to ponder. Uh, we're out of time now. Um, as I said, next week, I want to try and really do a bit of a cleanup. I've started it this week trying to bring some of the things that I've been talking about for the last two years together. And then I want to move into a new phase of just really focusing on specific inner exercises. I want to try and discover and figure out all of the inner exercises I can that are contained within the literature, that are contained within Georgia D's books, that are found elsewhere, and start to bring them together because it is through this inner work that we evolve our being, that we begin to grow. At any rate, thank you guys for being here. Um, <laughs> uh, giving you a lot to think about, a lot to uh, ponder. Uh, this is an incredible system. Um, it explains so much when you begin to understand it at the deeper level. Um, thank you both for being here. Uh, take care. Uh, bye now. And those of you on Facebook, thank you. Those of you watching on YouTube, thank you. Bye.